relationship between Alistair Crowley and Paul Gauguin is an interesting one. Although the two men never met personally, they followed in many ways a similar path. Like Crowley, Gauguin suffered abominable press during his lifetime, an onslaught which relegated his art to the curious ramblings of a very odd old man. To the Crowley student, this sounds vaguely familiar. The separation of the artwork itself from the often sensational life of its creator is a key point in the understanding of many genres, no less esoteric art. In his own lifetime, Gauguin was considered a vagrant and a violent man. His penchant for young brides doing little to quell the bad press. The truth is that many artists suffered a great deal of public persecution during their lifetime, which more often than not obscured their artistic legacies for decades, sometimes centuries after their death. Leonardo da Vinci was charged a sexual de degenerate in his native Florence. Caravaggio was a well-known violent drunk, eventually murdering a man in the early morning streets of Rome. Van Gogh was famously discarded as an insane, socially awkward clerical dropout who sold one painting in his lifetime. As word about Alistair Crowley's journeys in Sicily made it back to his native England, the press undertook what Crowley's future publisher P.R. Stevenson described as a campaign of personal vilification unparalleled in literary history, resulting in headlines as extreme as the wickedest man in the world and the man we want to hang. In 1923, the Italian government stepped in to deal with the unwanted publicity and expelled Crowley despite the petition of local villagers for him to remain. Without Crowley, the few residents were left struggling to make ends meet, and the artworks which have become known as the Nightmare Paintings or the Palermo Collection were sold to a local art teacher who befriended Crowley at the time in a bid to assist his remaining wife and child. The surviving works show a direction in Crowley's artistic life never seen previously and an approach to which was completely in line with his magical progression. The parallels are obvious. At the age of 43, Gauguin, a stockbroker, had abandoned Europe for art and Tahiti, establishing his Maison du Jour, or House of Carnal Pleasure. Crowley, at the age of 44, had abandoned England for the Abbey with his lovers and immersed himself in his art. Crowley consecrated his abbey to Gorgan. For Crowley, art and magic were one, and the symbolist concept of the artist as prophet had no better exponent. He wrote in his diary, The artist is a creative genius, that is, he is of the nature of Godhead, which devised the soul as a medium for self-realization. Also, as history assures us, the artist is of the caste of the initiated rulers of mankind. He understands the theory of the universe. He is an epoch of the mysteries of nature and a hierophant of the inviolable sanctuary. Like Gauguin, Crowley decorated every wall in the abbey with images. His central room, known as the Chamber of Nightmares was covered in grotesque murals designed to enact a change in consciousness for the sitter. The purpose of these pictures, wrote Crowley, is to enable people by contemplation to purify their minds. His writing of the period showed clear intimacy with Gauguin and Gauguin's methods, but Crowley extended it further into the spiritual realm, in a way that Gauguin nor the Nabi were ever able to. Gauguin sought to paint what a subject felt like. He felt that this was the path to real knowledge. Gauguin said, paint the green, the green tree as green as you possibly can. Crowley would reach further. He wrote, one should absolutely discover the true subconscious will of the detail of work for the time being before starting. The operation will then help to manifest in form. Crowley joined the role of the artist with the art of the magician, with the shared aim to make the invisible visible. Do what thou wilt to manifest in form, express the magical image. 
comparable to the subconscious expressions of the true self. Crowley's artistic process joined with his magical process in a practice of discovering the true self and enabling its expression. He achieved the union of extremes sought by Pappas and the early symbolists, fulfilling in magical terms the process of purifying the microcosm in order to unite with the macrocosm. At the height of his artistic prowess, Crowley attained the highest grade of the AA, that of Ipissimus, meaning literally, own very self. Using the philosophy of Thelema, he perfected the model of the artist as prophet. He solved Gorgon's puzzle and extended the artist into the realm of the initiate and the magician.